So, now we're going to run some pictures by folks and uh, see if you can catch what's going on in the images that isn't quite right. So, for example, what's wrong with that picture? Okay. There you go. So there's an image of an infrared camera and they're doing an air leakage test. So they've got a big fan installed in the house that's part of the energy assessments that Cape Light Compact offers. And that big fan sucks air out of the house. So what you're seeing is you're seeing hot air from the attic getting sucked in all around these edges. Not only around the trim, but around the actual hatch itself. And so in the winter, if that's not sealed up, all of your hot air, or not all of it, but a good portion of it, will go right up and out around those gaps, as you can see. How about this picture? Bokeh. It's metal on metal, most of the time. It's probably not going to be sealed particularly well. I'd even say, frankly, that there probably should be some insulation in there of some sort because that's just a piece of sheet metal, well not sheet metal, but it's a piece of metal that's not particularly thick and that'll just let heat straight out too. But more importantly with air, a lot of times what happens in a house is you have cold air that comes in at the bottom of the house around a basement or a crawl space and then it heats up because it's next to people or it gets run through a heating system or what have you and then it rises through the house and escapes out through the top. And as heat is, is leaving the building, or as air is leaving the building, the same volume of air has to come in someplace else. And you just have this conveyor that just sends air in and out of your house. I'd say the average house probably changes 100% of the air in it at least one and a half times per hour, mm. for the most part. I'd say that's a pretty reasonable average. And where you ideally want to be is 35%. Uh, Below that, that's when you start to have to think about indoor air quality, does the house breathe enough? And there are calculations specifically set up to test for that kind of a thing. So how about this? What's wrong with that picture? Uh, other than that. <laughs> so other than the door being open, is there anything about that refrigerator that uh, that's not ideal. It's too empty. That's exactly right. So even like I said, if you've got a refrigerator you don't need to have full, it's helpful to put jugs of water in the back. Not only does it help keep it cooler, it helps it last longer if the power happens to go out, it helps to reduce the energy usage of that appliance, and if you ever need water, you have some containers of it sitting in the back. How about those? Looks like those are up on ceilings, kind of like these. This is, and you guys, are, you guys are good at this. So yeah, it's the same sort of thing. Again, warm air, and because we're in a heating climate, most of the time we think about heating systems, uh, the hot air is going to go up and it can get out right around the gaps around these different, uh, these different fixtures. How about this? Has anybody seen one of these before? This is a bathroom fan, for the record. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what's going on here with this bath fan? It's vented into the yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> wow. Have you guys seen it? Uh, yeah, it's venting right into the attic. Now, this doesn't have to do specifically with energy usage, but it does have a lot to do with durability of your house. <coughs> you think about it, right below this presumably is a bathroom, and a lot of bathrooms have a shower or a bathtub or something like that, which can generate a lot of steam, and if you just vent the bath fan into the attic, when you turn that fan on, it's just going to dump a whole bunch of hot, moist air up into the attic, goes up, goes next to your insulation if you happen to have any, this uh, house doesn't really seem like it does, uh, it can go up and it can hit the underside of the roof, cause all sorts of issues, <coughs> and it's generally an issue of durability. So if you happen to have something like that, and by the way, if you get an energy assessment through the Cape Light Compact, that's one of the things that uh, the assessors check for, is those kinds of things. I have a question. Yes. 
Um, we actually had that in our house mm -hmm. and had people like come back from in, give the energy out of it, and they vented it to the outside. Okay. The question I had though is in the inside, in the bathroom, yep. I feel cool air coming through the fan. Hmm. So I'm wondering if there is there supposed to be a baffle in there or there should be typically they not allow the air to come back in is what I would think. Yeah, there usually yeah. is in most bath fans some sort of a, a damper that holds closed and until you turn the fan on it blows open and lets the stuff out. Yeah. So I wonder if that damper either doesn't exist or if it got stuck. No, it would well, be, be in the fan. fan. It would be close to this. In the fan? Yeah. Okay. Yep, it would be close to or part of the fan itself. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. How about this? Mm -hmm. whole simulation. Yeah. A lot of old homes have things like this. It's called a chase. Yeah. Yep. And with the chase, the uh, the typical way that you build homes back probably before nineteen. 50, maybe, would be with balloon framing. What that meant was you just had open cavities that ran up and down through the walls. So if you had, let's say, a weight on the end of a rope, you could go up to the attic, go to the edge wall, drop the weight down the wall, and someone in the basement could pick it up. There are also a lot of chases kind of like these, around plumbing fixtures or heating and cooling equipment. And like I said, a lot of air can come in through the lower levels of the house, heat up, and go right up through the top. So, you want to do things like this to it, or let us do it. You can see that someone installed a lot of uh, sheet metal around these openings and then held it in place with expanding spray foam, which is fire rated for the record. Here's another fun example. Okay. No contact between the insulation and the floor specifically. That's really hard to see. Yeah. But the point I think this helps to make is it's not enough that the insulation is installed just generally. It has to be installed correctly. It's the same thing if you're going out again in the blizzard and you have on your nice uh, warm jacket, but you leave the zipper open. Well, then air could just go underneath it and you're going to cool right off. This is the same sort of thing. You want your insulation to touch the place that you want to keep a certain temperature. How do you do that when there's no uh, ceiling to uh, hold anything uh, in a row? Mm -hmm. You can do it a couple of different ways. <laughs> um, I would probably argue that this isn't enough insulation in the first place. And so taking that out and putting in more that is the correct depth would certainly do the trick. And then to hold it in place, I've seen a couple of different things used. One is a fine mesh that you actually staple to the underside of these joists, and that holds it in place. And I've also seen, I don't know how to describe them, they're basically pieces of metal. They're almost metal rods that are pretty flexible. And so what you do is, you put the insulation in place, and then you push the rod into place. It's almost like a tension rod, exactly, like you might hang curtains with. And that goes up just enough that it holds the insulation where it's supposed to, but not too much that it compresses it. Because when you crush insulation, it doesn't insulate as well. For the record, I was an energy auditor before I started doing <laughs> like complex, so it's fine on a lot of this stuff. And then you can also see evidence of both moisture and mold. Those things just mm -hmm. don't look particularly great. <laughs> Messed up the timing of that animation, sorry about that. <laughs> Uninsulated room and van joist just above the foundation walls. So again, this is all insulated, but those spots aren't insulated. Here we go again. Someone took uh, the, well, this section of insulation that's supposed to be there and pulled it away from the craft facing and sort of that paper that you see sometimes on uh, different kinds of insulation, but most of the time fiberglass. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, except for one thing. So <laughs> so that insulation all looks good, that's all insulated, the ductwork. A couple of miles from 
months ago, we would have mentioned the light, but now we're... Mm -hmm. Hopefully they would have changed it. Yeah. Supply dots. Again, this doesn't have to do um, as much with resiliency, but it's again a pretty good picture, just because a lot of folks see these kinds of things. Ducts are not supposed to go down 90 degrees, over 90 degrees, up. I think I, oh, what was it? Don't quote me on this, but I think every 90 degree turn you put in duct work is the equivalent of adding something like three or five feet of length in terms of its resistance. Mm -hmm. So having those kind of ducts makes it a lot harder for the system to push air into the rooms it's supposed to go in. Makes the fan work harder, which uses more energy, and it also can help make those rooms uh, less comfortable. This is a really funny one, actually. That's why I like this one. It's a, it's a huge duct. And what I point out is, so this, this one that it's attached to is going down here to get heated up, and then the hot air comes up here, and then goes over here, and then just goes down. For some reason, the supply and return and side units are connected. <laughs> Uh, could, that, could that be for um, a change, uh, going from heating to cooling or something like that? Or? Probably not. Okay. Sometimes you might adjust some of the dampers for heating or cooling, but <laughs> connecting the supply to the return so close to the furnace, yeah. I, I have no idea why someone did that, <laughs> quite frankly. So. This is a resiliency of a different kind. Um, the water heater is starting to fall apart. Has anyone ever heard of an anode rod for electric water heaters? So a lot of times, electric water heaters will have what's called an anode rod. And some gas ones too, but a lot of the time electric. And the anode rod is a piece of metal that is about the same height as your water heater. And its entire purpose is to be eaten away by minerals in the water. The minerals are attracted to the particular kind of metal that it is. I don't remember what exactly it's made out of. Um, but it prevents the minerals from eating away at the tank, causing stuff like this. Exactly. And the thing is, the anode rod is sacrificial. It goes away over time. So, I would look at your owner's manuals if you happen to have an electric water heater, or even if you don't, and find out whether you have an anode rod. And if you do, how often you should check to see what condition it's in. And in particular, whether or not um, a, an HVAC technician or a plumber should come out and take a look at it. Because if you replace those with some level of frequency, that can help prevent this kind of damage. Or worse, it just straight up eats right through and goes everywhere. But you can also it see that there's more problems around it. Too. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Uninsulated water pipes. During uh, the winter, sometimes your basement gets cold, especially if the heat goes out. The heat goes out, water gets, uh, or the, the air gets really cold in basements sometimes, and if you have water pipes down there, and especially if they're uninsulated, you run the risk of having them freeze, and then when the water comes back, or the heat comes back, they can uh, spring a leak. So, insulating hot water pipes is a way to help mitigate that risk and it also helps save energy because you're keeping the hot water that's going through the pipes hotter so that you're not losing as much temperature that allows you to run the hot water a little bit less. I had a question if you have an underground basement and you lose your power obviously there will be some heat coming up from the ground outside into your basement. Mm -hmm. Will that keep it warm enough in your basement to prevent the pipes from freezing? It might. Mm -hmm. Most of the, I think the, the average ground temperature is about 55 degrees for the most part. So if you're able to keep your basement, if it's underground, at about that temperature, then you should be okay. The trick is if you have a lot of air leaks that change the temperature or drop the temperature in your basement, if you have these pipes that are really close to, let's say, an outside spigot that you didn't drain or that's not frost proof, that that can bring cold in. Um, but for the most part, if it's interior, 
and well insulated and well air sealed, you're probably more okay. Yes? I have a second question about if you have a heat pump air and cooling, heating and cooling system, will that work when your power is out? No. Nope. Because that requires electricity to run the compressor and to do all the, the, um, the heating and cooling in particular, and then just to you know, run a fan and move the air around. Okay, home stretch. You may have seen a lot of houses like this before. It could even be, uh, be yours. Is there anything here that is uh, noticeable? Yes. There's an interesting, interesting patterns here, yeah. You can see that there are a couple of beams right here that just don't seem to have any insulation on them at all. And you can tell because the heat on the inside came up and melted those spots, but right here, it's not melted. See how this melt spot here, melt spot over there, about equal distance from the sky. <coughs> Could be recessed lights there. If you're if you're outside, uh, is covered with ice and snow. Does that keep people inside dry? Not necessarily. Depends on the kind of attic that you have. If you have like a, an attic where your insulation's on the floor and you have vents, for example, then it'll get as cold as it is <laughs> outside. But if you have a cathedral ceiling it might keep it a bit warmer inside. It's plausible. Yes. yes, that's right. So here it looks like this is the inside of the house. And we've got a cold ceiling, because it's not insulated particularly well. And those cold spots are helping to condense moisture that's inside the house the same way as if you had you know, a can of soda or something outside in a hot summer day where it's humid, condenses on there, condenses on here, and it helps stain the ceiling, which is unfortunate for this particular homeowner. And everyone's favorite, ice dams. Does anyone know what an ice dam is in particular and how a lot of times they're formed? Well, whether or not you knew, I was going to tell you. <laughs> uh, so an ice dam, a lot of times the way it forms is this. You have insulation, hopefully, in your attic someplace. But where you don't have it is where, let's just imagine for a second, this is, uh, this is your roof line here. So what can happen is if you don't have much insulation or if you have a recessed light like these that are not air sealed, and it's right up close to the edge of the roof, heat can escape from these areas and melt snow right on the edge of the roof, right about here or so. What can then happen is that melted snow, the water, runs down until it's no longer attached to the house and it gets cold. Then it freezes and it forms a dam of ice all along the edge of the roof line. And then as more snow behind that melts from the heat escaping from your house, it builds up behind the dam and it works its way under the shingles and into the house. Mm. For a lot of times that's how that works. Obviously, very simple ways to fix that would be stop letting the heat escape. If you have recessed lights, seal them up. If you've got other air leaks around those areas, seal them up. If you have not enough insulation, or if you have insulation, but it doesn't go all the way to the edge, if it stops about here because the installers just didn't feel like you know, cutting it or crawling all the way to the very edge, it needs to make sure that it goes all the way to the edge. And that can help prevent ice dams like that. And there's a really interesting um, video that I saw once that was almost like that uh, there's a hole in the bucket song where you, you start at one point and you wind up back at the same point after a while. It was talking about how a homeowner had, had to fix their basement because it had gotten water in it, and they spent a bunch of money putting in a basement subfloor, and then they had to paint the ceiling, and they had to do all this different stuff because they wound up uh, creating ice dams for themselves by accident. 
They made a bunch of changes that they didn't actually need to make to their house, and they wound up creating an ice dam, which then flooded their basement. And what they could have done was seal up some recessed lights that had a big halogen uh, hot lamps in them, and that would have prevented that whole enterprise. So the cost of $500 worth of work turned into $8,000 in fixing the basement. So that's the kind of stuff we're thinking about here. So what can you do and how can Cape Light Compact help? Uh, the easiest way is to schedule an energy assessment. The assessments are at no cost other than what you, again, pay on your electric bills every month. And it's a whole house approach. We don't look at just one room or just the attic or just the basement. We look at the entire house all together. We do, what, this is the, the fan I was talking about earlier. It's called a blower door test or a, an air leakage test to find out where the air leaks are in the house and then uh, how bad they are, how big the leaks are, and then how to fix them. Uh, we give you a plan with all the different recommendations and estimates as to how much energy and money you'll save per month. And then we have pretty generous incentives. All the air sealing that you do is covered 100%. We pay for the whole kit and caboodle when it comes to air sealing. When it comes to insulation, we pay 75% up to $4,000, and you pay 25%. And if you are a full-time renter that pays their own electric bills, we pay for 100% of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is true. And we also do combustion appliance testing. So if you have natural gas, propane, fuel oil appliances in your home, we'll test and make sure that they're working safely and efficiently, that all of the noxious fumes are getting out the way that they're supposed to. And we'll change out incandescent lights with LEDs. Uh, not CFLs anymore, fortunately. Um, we also have what's called the heat loan. And the heat loan is a zero interest loan the Cape Light Compact pays the interest that you can use for big kinds of improvements. So if you need to change, let's say, a heating and cooling system because it's about to go, or you've got, um, you know, that 25% that of the insulation is going to be 5000 and you just can't swing $5,000 right now, but you want to get it done, the heat loan can help you do that. You get the energy assessment, the assessor can fill out a form, you bring that form and an application form to a number of different participating banks, and it goes all through them. And uh, and like I said, it's 20, up to twenty-five thousand dollars repayment terms up to seven years, and there's no interest because we pay for it. Yeah. One time, didn't they do Windows too? We so for the heat loan. Windows can be covered under the heat loan, but only after everything else has been done. And the reason is, Windows oftentimes are the least cost-effective energy efficiency related improvement you can make. Simply because if you were to say, put insulation in your attic, uh, you might spend $2,000 putting a lot of insulation into a reasonably big sized attic. For Windows, a lot of times to get the good ones, looking at between $600 and $1,000 per window. So for a whole house, if you're changing the whole place, I mean, that's tens of thousands of dollars sometimes. And oftentimes what you find is when you do energy modeling on a home, those uh, windows might only save $40 a year per window. So it just winds up being not, most of the time if they're good condition, functioning windows, um, they're not cost effective, and that's why we will cover them under this, but only after everything else has been done. A couple questions, yes? Is there any income eligibility requirements for the loan? That is between you and the bank that you go to uh, in terms of income eligibility. To my knowledge, not really. So Absolutely. Yeah. And again, this is where energy efficiency in today's uh, topic today, resiliency, they kind of work hand in hand. Your house is better insulated, less air gets out, less heat gets out, the power goes out, you stay a bit warmer for a bit longer than you might normally. Given how hot it's been this summer, 
We've had a lot of people call it. So if you were to call today and get yourself on the list, you would get a call back to schedule the appointment in four to six weeks. And then once the call comes in to schedule, typically the actual appointment takes place a couple of weeks thereafter. So right now you're looking at between a month and a half to two months before, um, before the visit would likely take place. Yeah. So to um, put in LEDs, we need to change the fixtures too, right? So these are just screw in the compact fluorescents? They actually, they actually changed out the fixtures. The fixtures suck. So they went from the incandescent to um, new fixtures. So I, I assume that the balance is part of the fixture. I, like most of the time it's not. Okay. Most of the time the, the CFL, the spiral part, goes into the plastic base and the ballast is built into that. Okay. And so if you just unscrew that whole thing, it should take the ballast with it. I don't think that there should be anything built in that it, it screws into that, that would be incompatible with an LED. I okay. don't think. All right. For the most part, no. Unless it was one of those big you know, tube lights like you might see in an office or something. Okay, so, so if for some reason that is the case, and we have the old fixtures, the LEDs go directly into an incandescent fixture. With no Almost always, yes. Yep. Yeah, just as long as the base is the right size, it'll screw right into whatever you have now. And the other nice thing about it is, let's say you've got a lamp that's rated for maximum 60 watts. You could put in the equivalent of a 100 watt lamp because it only uses 8 or it only uses 20. So you could put in a lot more brightness without exceeding the maximum rating for that particular lamp. That rating is based on heat output, right? It's based on wattage, typically. I think okay. probably where it comes from is heat, um, but you should be fine either way. Okay. So just to give you another idea of other things uh, that we offer, we have a lot of different incentives beyond just the home energy assessment. If you need a new ENERGY STAR uh, certified room air cleaner, there's an incentive for that. Dehumidifiers, clothes dryers, uh, chimney balloons, those help with air leakage, central air conditioners, thermostats. We've got a lot of different uh, incentives. And this page comes straight out of, there's a little green pamphlet on the table just out there that says 2016 residential rebates. It's, it's this image on the inside. <laughs>